be an immediate starter, or hit the roster running, and it's all neat, you know, just to watch the firsts for everybody. Yes, and um, glad to have you back, man. It's been a while. I'm gl- glad. Yeah. Have you had any PTO lately? <laughs> no, uh, <clears throat> but that's why I'm on the show, right? Because I I'm gonna head down to New Orleans, so I'm just trying to get a get a quick CST fix in. Good, good. Uh, it wouldn't be an episode of CST without some hiccups, so hopefully we got those all resolved. It looks like we've got that uh, fish fixed. So thank you everybody in the chat room who's uh, paying attention. Thank you very much for doing my job for me. <laughs> we also welcome back to the show the Wolf Man, Bill Wolf. Bill, how you been, buddy? Good, actually. I uh, had a, a really good trip to Chicago, and I'll talk about that here in a minute when you're ready. But uh, it's been a while. It's been a long time since I've been on the show. Uh, got sick over the winter and uh, had some technical difficulties with my work computer and our new format. But I think here I am, and I'm back, and I'm happy to be back. So, thanks. Yes. We are very glad to have you back. Uh, you were there in Chicago for the Super Draft, so I'm looking forward to getting your thoughts <clears throat> on uh, everything that happened there in the Windy City. Um, obviously, Major League Soccer couldn't have picked a warmer weekend or a warmer time to do a draft, but it is the offseason. There's only so much you can do. Um, but uh, but no, I mean, look, by all accounts, it sounds like FC Cincinnati had a really good draft. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on with Luke when he joins us on the King's Hammer Hotline, but I want to start off the show with uh, basically, Bill, just kind of fill the audience in on your experience at the Super Draft. I mean, you were there. You had a chance to, to hang out with a lot of folks from uh, the, the different supporters groups. Um, how, about how many people made the trip, and just what was your overall experience? Um, overall, positive. I mean, it was a great time. I, I think I'd be interested in going back. Uh, you know, it was it was fun. A because it was the first time, and B just because you know I'd never been to a, an MLS draft before, so got to experience that a little bit. Um, you know, I think as far as supporters went, we, we were, we were okay. We were, you know, maybe <clears throat> 20, I would say roughly about 20 people. Uh, I think we could have done a lot better if they hadn't done it so early. Um, you know, it seemed like there was a lot of people that were pretty excited to go. And then all of a sudden they changed the time to, you know, noon central time. And, you know, it, it just, it affected everybody's ability to get, you know, a half day's work in and get out of there, et cetera. So, yeah, it was it was kind of a bummer that we couldn't do better, but at the same time, you know, I thought the support was great, um, and you know, it was fun. You know, it was just, uh, you know, it, it was about the kids, right? I mean, it was about these guys getting signed, and, um, you know, yeah, we cheered, and we were there. We tried to make them feel welcome, and the idea was this was a big day for them, uh, and some of these people are hopefully going to be big big names for FCC someday, and we were there to be the first ones to welcome them to the club. So it was fun. Was there anybody, obviously we know you've, you've run into Don Garber in the past and Dan Cordemanch from uh, Major League Soccer headquarters, but was there any like soccer royalty or soccer celebrities that you, you were kind of like, wow, he's here, like th- th- that you thought was pretty neat? Um, not really. Uh, you know, as far as, you know, MLS, of course, the two you mentioned were there, Don and, and uh, Dan, and uh, there was probably a few other people floating around, but it wasn't really, uh, you know, there wasn't like big reporters there or, or anything. I mean, of course all the coaches were there, you know, Bob Bradley was literally sitting right in front of us cause the LAFC group was, was, uh, sitting right in front of us. So, you know, you, you got to see some, some coaches like that. Um, there was a big crew contingent that came out. <clears throat> if anything, that was probably the one, uh, downer for the whole thing uh, just in the sense that i you know i have to give them props they outdid us um they they chartered a bus i don't know who paid for that bus um but you know they they showed up with you know 40 or so people um ready to have some fun and uh they were a group, great group of guys so there was no uh no ugly going on mls set them next to us and and uh you know, there was of course banter, but there was also like, you know, we're here to have some fun. So in fact, they invited us all to a, a, a post draft, uh, drink at a bar across the street. So, cool. you know, yeah, it was, in fact, you know, I'll just say for people who, who are looking forward to the, the rivalry, I think it's going to be a great rivalry. Um, I think it's going to be very clear that for 180 minutes during the next season, we and Columbus are going to hate each other. 
Um, and there's no doubt there will be massive banter building up to that. And sure. A lot of things being said during the games. But at the same time, uh, I think everybody there felt the same way, which is when we're not playing each other, it's Ohio against the world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think I think that's going to be fun. And, uh, you know, even some of the supporters from Chicago that were crew supporters said they were probably going to come to the games when we played Chicago. So, awesome. Yeah. So, you know, I think you know, it'll be fun. It'll be interesting to see how that, that pans out down their line. Well, good. I'm glad you had a good time. Uh, of course, our friend Jason Davis, who was doing his show, uh, the United States of Soccer from the convention, is feeling a little slighted that you didn't see any celebrities around there, Bill. I I'm totally I, kidding, of course. <laughs> I didn't I didn't see him. <laughs> no, you were uh, you were too busy chanting and cheering there in the in the draft hall. Certainly understandable. Yeah. Yeah, we were trying to make everybody feel welcome when they got signed. So yeah. So let's talk a little bit about um, what went down, I guess, since we last had a show on uh, Boston FC since I making some trades. Uh, leading up to the draft, uh, basically acquired the entire draft of the Philadelphia Union, also made a deal with LAFC. Um, what did you make of all the wheeling and dealing last week uh, leading into the Super Draft? It's pretty interesting, yeah, especially for, I think, all of us that are watching our first draft and trying to figure out uh, how this is all supposed to go. And, and then seeing some, some firsts for Major League Soccer with Philadelphia Union throwing away every single pick. They, no one's ever done that before. And so their coach came out and just said, eh, you know, I just don't feel like this is a good, good draft, a good class, and uh, I'm good skipping all this. Of course, he's got Bethlehem Steel and his own academy to lean on, so you know, a little more confident. Uh, making that decision, but uh, it kind of, you know, it was a big snub, and, and you wonder what the NCAA thinks of that and what Major League Soccer thinks of that. And, uh, you know, it was good for FC Cincinnati because they got a lot more picks to work with, and they they end up uh, wheeling and dealing some of those uh, further on. Oh, what about Chicago Fire? I mean, you know, if you want to look at who was there, right? Of course, we had FCC people there. We had crew supporters there. And you're in Chicago, so you had, you know, fire supporters there. And they were spread out through the room, and they were clapping and chanting fire and, and getting all excited. And then their draft pick would come up, and they'd trade it. And they did that <laughs> twice, you know. And, and on the second one, like, the you know, the guys were there chanting and waiting around for the second pick. And it's like they just said, and – a deal has been made and Chicago is not, you know, taking any players basically. And the guys just literally stopped, stood there for like 10 seconds, staring at the screen and then just turned around and walked out. It's like, how, why would you do that to your fans? It was crazy, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I was surprised too. When I saw that Philadelphia wanted to give away their entire draft and, and I obviously, you know, FC Cincinnati is trying to build the roster and, and acquire as much talent as they possibly could. They had the first pick in the draft, so we know that they took Frankie Umea, uh from UCLA, United States U-20 midfielder, uh, Generation Adidas player as well. We're going to touch on that here in just a few moments. Uh, as a reminder, you can always get in touch with us via email feedback at CincinnatiSoccerTalk.com. We are monitoring the chat tonight on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, so make sure you get in touch with us there. And, of course, uh, you can always support the show, CincinnatiSoccerTalk.com slash support. All right. Let's welcome in our guest of honor tonight, uh, he's making his re triumphant return to Cincinnati Soccer Talk. He joins us on the Kings Hammer Hotline. He is Luke Sassano, and Luke joins us now on the phone. Luke, welcome back to Cincinnati Soccer Talk. How are you, man? I'm doing well. A little bit uh, jet lag from the travel, but all is well. Well, good. good we're, we're, we're glad to have you with us. Um, First of all, congrats on the baby. It's been a while since we've chatted with you. Uh, you've been a very, very busy guy these last few weeks. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, just a little bit busy, but I guess busy <laughs> is good in most circumstances, right? That is true. That is true. Uh, so let, <laughs> let's dive into this first uh, draft for, for FC Cincinnati. Um, it's the first, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe this is the first MLS draft you've taken part of as a technical director, at least in Major League Soccer. Um did it go as planned, or was there anything that kind of threw you off or that you were kind of surprised by? Um, I think for the most part it went as we were uh, hoping it would go. Um, I think we set out with a, a pretty clear strategy of uh, what we wanted to accomplish, um, and we felt very comfortable with the outcome, uh, specifically you know, grabbing the players in, in certain positions that we felt we wanted to get a little bit deeper at, um, uh, but also at the same time being able to 
recoup uh, some assets as well um, in a trade. And I think we, we came out where we uh, were anticipating we would be. So I think overall we were very happy um, with the players and young men we were able to bring in uh, to the program. Um, and we're just looking forward to, you know, getting excited for preseason that starts next week and, and start to get on the field a little bit because it feels like a long off season for us. So I can only imagine for the fan base um, how long this off season has felt. So Luke, talk about, <clears throat> talk about this first pick a little bit. I mean, you know, it, it's the big moment for FCC that you literally have a light shining on your table. Uh, everyone's waiting with bated breath and then time out. Uh, let's wait four more minutes and have everybody stare at FCC. I mean, you guys obviously had to know who you were going to pick uh, going into the first, you know, the first pick. So what was going on there? Why, why the delay? Uh, what was going on that, uh, that provided all this wonderful drama? <laughs> well, I think we wanted to create a little bit more buzz and excitement. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, <laughs> we knew <laughs> we we knew what we were going to do. We were very confident from the beginning uh, that we were going to take Frankie uh, number one overall. Um, at the same time, we're also a club that is always going to make uh, decisions on the best interest of the club. Um, and so, if there are going to be offers out there that we feel um, may help us in the short term and the long term. Uh, of course, we're going to listen to those things. Um, but I think uh, our whole intention the whole time was to be able to select Frankie. Um, he's a player that uh, we're excited about. Uh, he has a big upside. Um, he's still a young man, only 18, um, only has one, obviously, college season under his belt and has seen his stock rise pretty quickly over the last nine months or so. Um, and we're just excited to, to bring him in, work with him, uh, see him develop, help on his developmental path. Um, and uh, really get them uh, into the group. Great. Um, this is Boston here. I'm explaining uh, – well, I kind of just want your opinion on the numbers. Um, going into the draft, we had 21 rostered spots um, already locked down, and we have 10 draft picks. So, of course, a lot of fans are doing the math, and wait a minute, the roster cap's 30. Uh, is there really a plan to use all 10 picks? And, and FCC uh, didn't end up using all 10 picks to trading away two and then uh, passing on the last two. Um, was there a plan um, in place with all 10 at any point in time or how did that shift as, as the draft went on? Yeah, definitely. I think um, just evaluating a, what our goals were going into the draft. Um, and I, and I think, as I mentioned, we feel pretty confident that we accomplished those goals um, of the, the players and positions we selected Obviously, when we make kind of an unorthodox and, and unique move, acquiring a, another team's full draft, uh, obviously the acquiring draft picks like that, and, and you can see them as being assets. Um, and we were able to turn a couple for, for some cash and allocation money, and then we were also to use one or two to actually select uh, players that we were targeting pre-draft. So, um, you know, the, the super draft has evolved over the years where uh, with the implementation of homegrown players and academies, um, you see, uh, past a certain number within the draft, um, there are less and less of availability, not maybe to say the talent has dropped off dramatically, but what I will say is teams just lack the sheer roster spots. Most teams are, are looking at the back end of their roster in terms of how they're building and where the league has grown um, to put academy players or players that have been sourced through their pipeline um, into those spots. And for us as a new team, um, we wanted to think a little bit outside the box. How can we uh, put ourselves in the best position to potentially grab some uh, players between the ages of 18 to 22 um, that maybe had a lot of upside, but were still raw and, and rough around the edges um, and really allow ourselves to have certain depth where maybe we could loan out a couple players. Maybe we'd be surprised by one or two players, um, but also give ourselves the best opportunity um, with a, uh, a mechanism like the uh, the super draft to put us in uh, an interesting situation. I think obviously as we went through the process and, and knowing that we had more draft picks than we had roster spots, uh, we were very clear about um, our strategy and, and what we wanted to get out of that and, and taking six players, um, but also having clear um, ideas of how we're going to use each one of those players throughout preseason and then throughout the course of their career with us. Um, we've been very, I would say um, uh, methodical in that approach and in, in taking each player's situation case by case, uh, but trying to do um, what we can to maximize not only our roster, but also our resources as a club as we're approaching our first season in MLS. 
Obviously, we we know you you had a lot of picks to start with. You end up only taking uh, six here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the the plans for some of these guys. You kind of hinted at loans, uh, and it's tough, obviously, because FC Cincinnati doesn't have a, a USL affiliate. Uh, so, what's the plan for some of these guys going forward? Well, I think first off, we want to see all of them in preseason. Um, we want to see you know how they shape up. Some guys are going to be more ready than other other players um some players are going to surprise you a little bit and some maybe uh just aren't ready for it and i think uh it's important for us to put plans in place that will help those individual players on the development path whether it's uh, with us in the near future or whether it's with us long term um and not having in a single uh, usl affiliate at the moment does afford us even more opportunities because we're we're able to really find the best situation for each player involved should we do decide to loan them and not even just in the USL. Um, I think with our network that we've created internationally uh, is to find landing spots for players that maybe will develop in a, in a different type of environment, whether that's Mexico, uh, whether that's Scandinavia. Um, so we're really opening up our doors in terms of player development. And specifically with this, these players, I think number one, um, we want to see them in our environment first and we hope they're all successful and, and we hope they all uh, make a strong showing in preseason once they get with the group. But at the same time, um, it's our responsibility to make sure we're prepared for uh, whatever outcome comes out of these next five weeks to make sure we're we're protecting the club's best interest in the short term and the long term. So, <clears throat> I mean, obviously, you know, there's been a lot of moves beyond the draft. So maybe let's start to talk about the roster more broadly at this point. And, you know, you've built the roster from the back. I mean, we have four keepers now, if you count the draft. We have uh, quite a, a load of defenders. Uh, we have uh, a lot of sort of sixes and eights. Um, and, and we've talked about the fact that the roster is uh, filling up, right? So we might have to loan some players out because, in, in effect, you had more draft picks than you even had spots. Um, so, you know, the roster is getting kind of tight and, and you have a lot of defense. There's not a lot of attacking power. So, you know, are there plans uh, to bring in some more firepower basically in the, in the near future? Or do you think maybe we're looking at like a summer transfer window to start to bring in some more uh, of, the, of the front type of players? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, in terms of roster build, when we set out to really build our, our strategy, um, we wanted to be very um, clever in terms of the resources we built and how the MLS has evolved in terms of teams spending a lot of money in the attack. There wasn't really a attention to the defense. And we wanted to be very clear about what type of team we're going to build, you know, a team that's very strong defensively, that's disciplined, uh, but that's athletic and dynamic going forward. I think in a couple of our acquisitions where you look at Greg Garza, Alvis Paul, those players are almost more wingbacks and they're attacking minded fullbacks. So they provide a, a definitely different dimension in the attack. Um, you can even say the same about uh, Mathieu Duplan, uh, who is a very versatile defender that can play out on the right. He can play in the middle. He can even play on the left. Um, and when you look at signing a, a player like Kendall Watson, you know, a guy that's been in the MLS for many years, uh, has been a best 11 player, um, is a leader in the back. Um, we felt the most important place for us to build is through our spine. Um, and I think when you speak with Alan and obviously his strategy and his, the type of player profiles that, that he wants within the group, um, if you look through the midfield, it's finding versatility. And you find guys that can play different types of positions, whether you're playing a, a 4 2 3 one, whether you're playing a 4 3 3 um, whether you're playing a, a 3 5 two, whatever the system is, the playing philosophy has to be very similar. So I think with the type of players we brought in, um, you look at Leo Bertone, Eric Alexander, you know, currently bringing up Fatai, um, you know, Victor. We've tried to set ourselves in a position that we have depth um, in every position. And I think if you build through the core and you build defensively, you give yourself the best opportunity uh, to come out um, in, in a strong way. And I think as, you know, as Alan uh, and his staff went through the process of really identifying um, what kind of players we wanted to target in, in certain positions or what kind of profiles. Uh, inherently, the, the answer always came back to building a strong defensive unit. And I think, you know, we're going to be a, a team and a club that prides itself uh, on how we defend um, and winning games that way. But more importantly, we want to be a, a smart team that when we do have the ball and when we do keep possession, that we're very dynamic going forward. Um, and I would, I would say that we have players that are very capable of going forward on the roster already. You have Leo Bertone, a guy who's a number eight, but he's attacking-minded number eight. 
Uh, you have Eric Alexander as well, who's attack-minded number eight. You have Corbin Bone, um, Manu Ledesma, two players obviously that have proved in the USL level, um, and we're excited to see what type of contributions they can give at the MLS level, especially Corbin you know, coming back to the league and Manu being a player that uh, has exceeded at, at certain stops he's been at. And then you look at top, and you obviously have uh, Fernando, and you have um, Darren. You know, we're, we're very confident um, with the group we have, although we see that we are maybe missing one or two or, or three pieces away from really being in a, in a perfect spot. And I think as a club, we're never going to rest. We're never going to be content. Um, we're going to be happy, and we're going to be excited, and we're going to be um, ecstatic to work with the group we have. But I think in professional sports, um, to maintain that competitive edge, you, you can't really be content um, with what you have. And I think that goes for, for every aspect of, of the club. And I think we've tried to, to show that in terms of our roster build. But it was a very clear strategy from, from the beginning in terms of building from back to front uh, to making sure we were, we were strong in that category. And looking at the numbers in terms of uh, analytics and where teams invest um, that maybe don't have the biggest budget in the league but want to be very clever in their, their build. Uh, it all came down to building through the spine. And I think we want to be a team that is, uh, again, uh, strong defensively, but very dynamic going forward. And, and that's a process. You know, building an expansion, uh, a new team uh, roster is a process. And, and we don't feel we're going to be done at all by the first game of the season. Uh, this is a long season. It's not how you start. It's definitely how you finish. Um, and fortunately, we have two windows in, in this uh uh, this sport that allows us to take advantage of certain opportunities. So not only are we looking at still improving the roster over the next couple of weeks, but we're definitely having an eye for that summer window um, to maybe bring in one or two different type of players, just depending on the next couple of months go. Hey, um, it's, it was pretty evident that strategy building from the back, um, we saw that coming forward, and I think it caught a lot of us off guard, actually, because of the the three years of attacking focus in USL, which is a whole different league with a with a no salary cap, and and so when when it came in uh, with the defensive mindset, it made sense, you know, being an expansion team with us with the salary cap in place, uh, starting from scratch, and uh, it was pretty neat to watch that shift in dynamics. Um, so you, as a technical director, always searching, always looking for the next best thing. Uh, in your opinion, what is this roster missing at this point in time? We, you know, ignoring all the rumors that are out there of, that fans may think of players coming in or not coming in. Um, what would be a what would be a good spot you'd like to see FCC fill um, now or in the summer window? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great point. Um, without giving too much away, I'll say I think we're we're one or two more pieces probably in the attacking third. Um, that can give us a different type of dimension um, that we're looking for. Um, we may be one or two more pieces uh, in the middle that provide a different type of stability uh, that we're looking for. And I think we're, we're also maybe one piece uh, on the outside um, uh, of play where it's a winger or somebody that can be a little bit more uh, dynamic in a certain capacity. Um, you know, having said all that, uh, you know, we're looking at the roster build and talking to Alan and his staff. We're all very excited with where the group is at uh, now, being a very tight-knit group, but guys that are willing to work for each other. And I think the, the important point I want to make is definitely to be strong defensively is obviously important in winning. And I think establishing a winning culture from the USL to the MLS is a big challenge in itself, but also establishing a winning culture from day one once we're playing in Seattle. You know, we want to be that type of team and club that, has those expectations and those, that bar set, even though we do know that it is a big challenge, but we don't want to sell ourselves short. Now what comes with that is obviously building the, the, the player strategy and how we're going to play. And we do want to be a attack minded team. We do want to be a team that scores a bunch of goals. Um, and in, in this, in this sport, it's uh, the team that scores the most goals wins the most games. So it's uh it's something we're very cognizant of, but at the same time, you also, to give yourself an opportunity, whether we're an expansion team or a regular team, um, I believe the, the statistic last year was uh, all 11 teams that missed out on the playoffs were statistically the 11 worst defenses in the league. So for us, that's a pretty strong correlation in terms of how we wanted to come out uh, from day one um, in building this group. So, we're very excited. We know we're not done building yet. We know we have a, a couple more pieces we'd 
we'd like to add. Uh, but we're, we're just really excited to, to get preseason going and, and seeing the guys, these guys all together. We're hanging out with uh, FC Cincinnati Technical Director Luke Sassano here on Cincinnati Soccer Talk. and give him a follow on Twitter at Luke Sassano. He's got time for Twitter. Don't worry, folks. Um, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about <laughs> the roster build. Uh, we've kind of talked about the Super Draft. We've talked about the, the expansion draft a little bit. Uh, so let's talk about, you know, when you're building this roster and you look ahead, right? And obviously you're looking ahead through the entire summer. There's a Gold Cup this summer. This is not something historically FC Cincinnati has had to plan for in their first three years as a club. Now that changes. Uh, so when you're factoring in decisions as far as who you're bringing in, the fact that guys are going to be leaving on international duty, how much does that play a factor in bringing them into your environment? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, we want to bring in players that are going to make us more competitive. Uh, and the challenge is when you bring in good players, um, most of them have national team commitments in some capacity. So first off, well, that's something we welcome, and we're always proud and excited to have players being called in with their respective national teams. I think secondary to that, just in terms of uh, being an expansion team um, in year one with a, a tournament like the Gold Cup, um, we do have to be cognizant of that. Um, and whether we're bringing in guys that may participate in that um, because they're still uh, unknown what rosters will be going into that is to make sure we have the adequate depth um, to be able to protect those type of roster moves because um, our responsibility is to obviously build a team that can win from day one and make ourselves competitive. But we also have to look not just uh, this year, we have to look uh, in 2020 and we've got to look in 2021 as well. And I think every decision we make, whether it's a guy getting a contract for one year or two years or whatever it may have you, uh, it, it's building this team in a way that um, we can protect our short-term and long-term interests as we go into this season. Um, and specifically with the Gold Cup, you know, we'll be very excited uh, if we have any of our players called up in their respective national teams. But at the same time, we also are prepared with a contingency plan. And at the end of the day, it just gives more opportunities for guys that need to step up. And I think that's the exciting part of this sport um, is that it's always a, a next guy up mentality, especially with our group. Um, and I think that allows that competitive edge uh, to be taken into everyday and trading. And, you, and if you can foster that uh, in a positive way, it's only going to elevate the group. And I think that's what we've been trying to build is, is to have depth, especially in the midfield, especially in the defense, um, that potentially as guys do get called away uh, to their respective national team this summer, we have a competitive balance throughout the entire uh, roster build. So I think to your, your point, which is a very unique one and a unique year we find ourselves in, um, we're very cognizant of that. So the expansion draft was a little bit, um, I guess, a little over a month ago. And the burning question we continue to get, and I'm sure you're just bombarded with it all the time, is what's going on with Roland Lama? Um, he's the one guy <laughs> from the expansion draft that hasn't been signed. Uh, so can you fill us in on where we stand with Roland Lama? <laughs> uh, first off, we're, we're very excited and optimistic uh, of how the conversations have gone with Roland and his representatives. Uh, Roland has obviously had you know, two successful seasons in MLS. He's garnered a lot of interest internationally. Um, you know, we, we're very confident of where the conversations are at the moment. Um, and, and hopefully we'll be very excited to, to add him to the group. Um, you know, when we went through the expansion draft process, uh, a lot of the players that were available really weren't available because there's a lot of different rules and mechanisms within the MLS that doesn't allow you to pick certain players or players that are out of contract or players that have their options declined. Um, so every player falls in their own unique circumstance. And I think with Roland, it was finding and making sure we find a valuation um, that makes sense for, for FC Cincinnati, but also makes sense for the player as well. Um, and, and, you know, he's always been excited about, the opportunity to, to join uh, FCC, and we're hopeful we'll come to a resolution pretty soon. So the questions just keep getting tougher. <clears throat> um, we have to ask, of course, because, you know, this is the way things work and, and people want to know. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I, I know what your comment's going to be, but but I'll try to expand to give you something more to talk about. Obviously, people are, are wondering about rumors, uh, you know, talk about Cruz being almost an imminent signing, uh, you know, quotes uh, of him talking to players on our existing roster. Uh, Fernandez, uh, another player uh, currently listed as a, as a very strong possibility for FCC. 
Uh, so obviously we'd love any comment on, on either one of those, mm -hmm. but, but, but just to expand a little further, obviously, as we're looking for players, you know, it, are we interested in even these players? Are we interested in players like these? And, and then again, how do we deal with the international spots? Because at this point, I think we have seven international spots and I'm not sure you, you would know better than me if we've traded away our eighth. So. Oh, great questions. I, I love the hard ones. Those are always my favorite. <laughs> um, I will, I, I will say that, uh, you know, those are two guys that are currently under contract with their respective clubs. Um, they're definitely two players in unique and different circumstances. Um, but guys that obviously, uh, you know, uh, Matias is one who's played with the Chilean national team for many years. He's played at the highest level. Um, and obviously when you look at Allen, he's a budding young talent um, in the region uh, that's been uh, a big part, I think, of the next wave of, of the Costa Rican national team. So two different types of players, two uh, different players that can bring different looks. Um, but again, with respect to their current contract situations and, and with their current clubs, I'd probably have no comment on both of those guys. Um, but what I will say is, uh, you know, international spots is a great question. And with the MLS, our roster compliance date is March 1st. So there can always be, um, you know, things we're looking at right now, but we're preparing for March 1. And I think at the same time, as we bring in players, that always requires us to make, make moves, whether it's improving our roster, um, and that's whether it's uh, trading for an uh, international spot, uh, whether guys are in uh, the current stages of their green card process, which we have a couple of guys in that stage as well. Um, so it's all these things that are functioning behind the scenes that on surface, um, they may seem that they're a little bit more uh, complex than they really are. Um, but we know that we have until March 1st to be roster compliant. Um, and that's something that will definitely be by then. There are a lot of reports uh, swirling. Well, maybe swirling is not the right word, Luke, but uh, a lot of reports that um, you know FC Cincinnati was interested in Ozzy Alonso, who ultimately ended up in, in Minnesota. Uh, how close were you guys to, to maybe potentially bringing him in, or was this much much ado about nothing? Um, I, I don't think it was ever got to the point where it was something that, uh, uh, that was as far maybe down the line as what's been reported. Um, listen, Ozzy is a, a player that, you know, he's 33 years old. He's played most of his career on turf, um, but he's also a, a champion. Um, and he's a, a guy that we have a tremendous amount of respect for. Um, I think he obviously need to need to make a decision that was the best interest for, for him and his family. And I think um, at the same time, I think he's a, a player that is uh, still a, a very, very good uh, defensive midfielder in this league. Um, but for us, uh, it was always a, not a question of, of Ozzy, but a question of how can we continue to make our team better. Um, and that's something we'll always fall back on, whether it's a, a player we're being linked to or a player we're not being linked to. Um, some reports are always stronger than others. Um, but what I will say is that we're always going to be a club that is looking to improve and be more competitive. Um, we're going to always bring in players that want to push themselves to the next level. And we're going to always want to bring in competition because at the end of the day, uh, we truly do believe that competition will breed, breed success. Um, and we want to be that type of club um, that players want to come to and be a part of, knowing that it's not going to be an easy task to play for FC Cincinnati. You're going to have to come in and work, but you're going to come in and you're also going to improve as well. And I think uh, most players um, see that as a positive challenge. Um, and, and we're not going to be a club that is for every player. We're going to be a club that is, is for a specific type of player and a type of profile that we feel uh, will help continue to make this club grow. We know that uh, right now you've got the, the number one spot on the allocation list. Um, any plans to, to use that in the summer, Luke? <laughs> Man, you guys do your homework. I'll tell you what. <laughs> wow. Um, we, we definitely are, are excited about having that spot. I think there's some – potentially some interesting opportunities that may arise. Uh, but at the same time, we know that's also an asset as well. Um, and if we feel we can bring in another player that maybe isn't via the allocation uh, mechanism, uh, but will improve us on the field, then we're by all means, we'll, we'll, we'll do a piece of business uh, in that capacity. But uh, you know, the allocation um, uh, order is very interesting, especially the allocation list as well. There's always players and rumors of guys coming back, but, it's also making sure that um, we have certain valuations of guys. And I think we've, 
you know, we've talked about Fabian in the past. We've talked about other players that may be on that list. Uh, but it, it has to make sense at the end of the day for our clubs uh, to make sure we can be as uh, competitive and successful as possible. Someone once told me the allocation list isn't just a, a free-for-all for a team, and you also have to have that player on board as well because he's the one that's got to sign the Major League Soccer contract. Um, <clears throat> but uh, moving on, um, we've had, we got this question from fans. Uh, some people were concerned about uh, with the wealth in the back, I guess, uh, where uh, someone like Deplon would play. Uh, would he move to center back? Uh, a lot of people assume he's a, a natural a right back. And so questions with how they would line up, and this might be more in Koch's area, but just trying to uh, figure out uh, what the plan is there. Yeah, no, great question. I think with, with Mathieu, uh, you know, he played for Montpellier uh, as a center back. Um, and he had, uh, you know, as a younger player when they won League One, um, that's where he featured in, in numerous amount of games. Uh, but he's also a very versatile guy that is comfortable on the ball, a good 1v1 defending in the channels, um, has much better speed than anticipated. Uh, and he's really a versatile player that we felt um, – uh, wanted to come to Cincinnati um, and he made a, a lot of sacrifices to be honest to, to come to Cincinnati and we feel at, at his age he's a guy that's going to help us not just um, in the middle but uh, potentially on the right depends on obviously what Allen wants to do uh, with the team and, and how he wants to put the team out on the field um, but uh, I, I think Matthew is a player that you know when you think about partnerships you think about um, how do you guys play together uh, some guys are, are going to be more suited to playing with different styles and different types of players. And I think uh, Matthew is a, a player that um, can adapt and develop within different systems, but also within playing with different types of players, whether it's a, a more physical, athletic type of center back or whether it's a more um, uh, dynamic uh, type of wing back or outside back. Uh, I think he has the ability to, to adapt to those situations and, and he's a player like the rest of our defenders that we're excited about. You know, some players you don't talk about, Forrest Lasso, uh, Nadam, um, guys that we're excited to, to see back in camp, Blake Smith, you know, from last year, uh, Justin Hoyt. We talked about these guys of, of coming in and really having a point to prove as well. So I think we're excited with, with the group we have. Um, we know we're going to be competitive in, in most uh, positions on the field. And, and the ones that we need to improve on, that's, that's what we're going to keep doing and working hard for these next couple of weeks. And obviously as our window doesn't close until May, even though the season kicks off, we still have time to improve our team before the summer hits. So we're very cognizant of that. We want to give ourselves the most flexibility as possible uh, throughout the roster um, to be able to, to make this team um, as competitive as we can be from day one. So Luke, uh, following up a little bit on Deplon, <clears throat> just real quick, um, you know, one of the one of the concerns fans expressed uh, online when when he came on board, and then we saw Powell come on board, and it seemed like there was maybe some shifting going on. Was, you know, he he might be a flexible player, but you know, he he speaks French, and you, you bring him into this lineup, and how well can he communicate if he's out of position? Um, so. If I understand correctly, there's actually quite a few players in the back line that speak French. So maybe elaborate on that to kind of make people understand that this isn't asking as much as people maybe think it is for him to move around a little bit. Yeah, I think with Nadam as well. Um, but also Matthew speaks English. And uh, I know he did his interviews in, in French, but he's, he's fluent in English. Um, oh, and he's a guy that, that. that can communicate. Yeah, and he's a he's a leader. He may not be yet comfortable doing interviews in English, uh, but uh, when we went out to dinner, he's fluent in English, no problem. Um, and he's also a guy that, you know, when Alan went to go see him play um, in training in France, um, he was a, a commanding guy in the back, uh, led vocally, um, was a guy that um, really took the, the team um, in the back four on his shoulders. And I think he's also a guy that has experience that, at a pretty high level, you know, defending against Neymar, defending against a couple other top ta attacking players in, in League One, playing in stadiums with 60, 50,000 people, um, that's experience that you really just can't teach. Um, and I think, you know, not only speaking uh, French, but he does, you know, speaking English, um, we're not concerned at all with, with his ability to, to assimilate to the group or, or adapt. We think he's going to um, be just fine. But at the same time, MLS is a, is a league that requires adaptation for a lot of international players and, and not only just for the style of play, but 
also for um, the traveling, um, uh, the different climates you're going to be playing in. So there's always that adaptation period that, um, you know, players like Matu, uh, Leo um, will go through, and it's just an organic part of the process. Well, look, we know you're a busy guy, and we really, really appreciate you you being with us here on Cincinnati Soccer Talk. I'll I'll get you out of here on this question because a lot of – you know, and, and I'm going to go back to the super draft here because for this question. Um, you know, when when Philadelphia made that trade with you to give away all of their draft picks, we saw a lot of people, a lot of the the so called pundits, uh, basically come out and say, you know, what's the point of the super draft? And obviously, this is your first super draft with FC Cincinnati, first as a club. Uh, is is it something that you want to see continue? Because there's been a lot of talk about maybe nixing the super draft and. Uh, maybe doing something else in the winter time amongst the clubs. Um, is it something you want to see continue, or do you think that maybe this will evolve going forward? And that's a great question. Um, I'll answer in a couple of different ways. I think being a player that went through the super draft process, um, it, it really is a, a wonderful and, a, and memorable experience mm-hmm. uh, being a young player um, to go through that and, and something you worked so hard for. Um, your entire life to have that one moment where your dream uh, in, in theory comes true because not all guys that get drafted get signed, but in theory, you think about it and it's such a momental uh, moment for these young men. Um, obviously that time period was a different type of time period. MLS has evolved with homegrown players and, and academy systems and, and all that. But I still think, you know, the college system is part of our, our fabric um, as a soccer society. And I think it offers different types of avenues for players that maybe didn't play in the academy system. I mean, Frankie and is a perfect example. Frankie played in the academy system, but not for a professional academy. He played for a, a club called Patty Doris in Southern California. So there, there are many, many players out there that have a different type of developmental path. Um, and one of those avenues is through the draft. Uh, do I think that um, the, the sheer depth of talent is probably not where it was and the sheer top end talent. Yes, but that's just an organic part of, of professional teams, um, uh, maintaining a, a streamline and development over the last five to 10 years of their academy systems and really honing in on their scouting and recruitment processes. But I think the draft does offer, um, uh, a, a credible platform and opportunity for uh, players that maybe develop, um, in a different type of path and, and are afforded a, an opportunity to really realize their dream. And, and being on the technical side of it, it is a fun event. It is fun to, to be there with the other teams and to go through the process of evaluation and, and figure out, you know, is there any players that can help us? But um, I think as you've seen how much MLS has evolved to where it is now, um, the ability for players to come from the draft um, and uh, impact MLS teams immediately uh, is getting farther and farther. And not to say that that by any means is diminishing the college talent or the, the level of player going to college. Yeah. I think what that's just saying is how far MLS has grown and the type of player um, and the type of professional uh, that is now coming into MLS, not just uh, from the players developed domestically, but the players that are coming from abroad. Good stuff, Luke. I know I said I had one more question. Uh, I lied. I have another one. <laughs> so, uh, we we heard a lot of talk this week about homegrown players. Uh, at what point can mm-hmm. we expect maybe starting to hear the words "homegrown players" and FC Cincinnati coincide? <laughs> well, hopefully sooner rather than later. Yeah. But I think you know we we made announcements. To obviously, you know, gear up our professional academy this upcoming season, and we hope to have some more announcements here. Uh, as we got through the super draft and as we're starting to, to build in many different arenas within the club. Um, but we know it's going to be a long process. I think um, as we start to, to build the Academy and in, in certain age groups and, and all that stuff, it's about creating a, a clear pathway and not just developing um, kids for, for FCC, but developing soccer here in the region and really being that kind of uh, center point, um, of, uh, of soccer development. And that's a big reason why we linked with Ohio South is we really wanted to have a holistic partnership that um, was able just to increase the game, whether that's increasing in a grassroots level, uh, in an education level from parent education, uh, referee coaching education, uh, because we know the fruits of that labor is going to be um, uh, integrated in, into the fabric of soccer 
um, in our communities here in Cincinnati, not just in the short term, but for the long term. You know, that kid that is uh, playing um, uh, soccer on the street uh, because uh, there's no access to a, a grass field uh, in downtown Cincinnati, whatever it may be, that that six-year-old kid is introduced to FCC and they're introduced to the sport of soccer in a different way. And by the time they turn 15, 16, uh, that player has already grown up with FCC and has already grown up with the sport of soccer in understanding that um, there's a, a clear uh, opportunity and there's a clear development path uh, that isn't just afforded to people that have the resources and, and the ability to play the game, uh, but to every type of uh, person and family um, uh, that can get access to the sport. And we want to be uh, a focal point. We want to be a centerpiece in that. Um, and we're trying to implement things right now within communities, um, outreach programs, um, the school events, different type of things that maybe not on the super competitive side, but are on the grassroots side of introducing the game and really knowing that, you know, uh, over this project, the next five to 10 years of really developing players internally in our system um, is something we really want to do. And we know uh, it, it's a process. It's a project. We hope sooner rather than later, uh, there is a player that, that we can call homegrown um, and come through the system. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we lay this foundation um, and these building blocks in the right way so that uh, not just only is our, acad our, our academy system and our first team benefiting from that, but the entire soccer region here in Cincinnati um, is benefiting from that as well. Well, we appreciate all the uh, the effort you're putting in. Uh, we cannot thank you enough. And on behalf of the fans watching the show tonight and listening to the podcast later on, uh, thank you for everything you've done so far for FC Cincinnati. We're excited. We could tell you're excited, and uh, we're looking to big things here in 2019. We always appreciate you coming on and, and love having the chats with you. Uh, it's been a blast, Luke. We really do appreciate it. Likewise, guys. I really appreciate it and uh, looking forward to catching up again soon, okay? All right. We, we're going to hold you to it, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> perfect get some sleep all right i'll try to i'll try to all right thanks soon. thanks luke that's uh thanks uh, luke thanks, sasano thanks. joining us here on the king's hammer hotline fc cincinnati technical director the man's been busy had a baby had the expansion draft had the super draft and they're still making moves to make this uh, major league soccer roster better we cannot thank uh luke enough for, for joining us here on uh, Cincinnati Soccer Talk this week. All right, it's that time of the show where we give a big shout-out and thanks to our tremendous supporters. So big thanks to Kings Hammer and Tim Bronsel, Matt Adamchick, Mama Subes, Brian Malone, Jamie Smed, Mike Hudson, Jonas Tom, Jack Emery, Mike Bowman, Kathleen Francis, Jesse King, Teresa Everidge, Matt Imholt, Sagan Sagai, and Matthew Long. These are our tremendous Cincinnati Soccer Talk supporters. These are just a few of the many that do support this show, uh, we could really use your help. Head on over to CincinnatiSoccerTalk.com slash support to learn more on how you can help support Cincinnati Soccer Talk going forward. All right, a lot to digest there, guys. Uh, always a blast having Luke on the show. What really stood out to you, Bill? Um, I was surprised that um, he didn't shoot down uh, Roland Lamont. I thought uh, as much time has gone by that he might just say, you know, well, you know, things don't always work out or something to that effect. Uh, but it sounded to me like he kind of gave us a, we really hope to see something happen there, which I was a little surprised by given the amount of time that's gone. Yeah. I was surprised by that one too. Um, but I guess maybe no news is still sort of good news. Uh, maybe <laughs> it could still happen. I don't know. Uh, anything that you really took away from that Boston? Uh, about that particularly, um, I thought it was neat he said Lamar was interested in FC Cincinnati because I think that's been one of the fears going around, uh, especially online, Twitter and Reddit. People are saying, well, maybe this kid doesn't want even want to come to Cincinnati and he's mad he got drafted. And, and I think that that kind of put that to bed. You know, it's uh, no, he is interested in Cincinnati. It's probably just uh, working out the particulars. And if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, you know, it's a bummer for, for probably all of us. But um yeah, I really liked I really liked that fresh take on there. I think it was needed, and uh, I think we did learn a little bit about it, <clears throat> even though it may not be a yes or a no yet. Yeah, um, we shall see. They've got till March first, so hopefully he's signed before then, so he can take part in preseason camp and 
all the friendlies that uh, you know they're going to be taking on here in the next few weeks. Uh, tr- they're going to be reporting the training camp here um, next week, I believe. So it's 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 coming fast and furious for for the you know FC Cincinnati faithful. So we're very very ex- lot to be excited about. So yeah, again, and go ahead, Boston. Oh, about the, the the international roster spots and all that. You know, we heard him say they've got till March first, like like you just brought up, and that gives them the entire preseason at home that gives them florida that gives them the uh, ccc and columbus where they'll be playing three other major league soccer teams i think they're going to get a really good look at all these players and it's going to help them sort through things like international spots and and hopefully they've got some green cards on the way that would help but if they don't um that's plenty of time to see what's going to work and what's not going to work and make some some decisions yeah we kind of touched on the academy a little bit there with Luke towards the end of that interview. We did get this email as we hit up the CST mailbag. Um, this is from Brandon Ramey. Uh, he says, one takeaway from the Monday show. I believe this is when we uh, we just spoke last week with Travis Clark from Top Drawer Soccer. Uh, hearing what Atlanta United did for their academy program, would King's Hammer be an option to become the FCC Academy? I know there was already a good relationship there, and King's Hammer has the DA so it attracts top level talent from the southern ohio uh, southern ohio northern kentucky area my club has sent a few players to the da when they outgrow our club so just a thought that would put our academy on the fast track now uh, what do you think about that bill obviously you've you've been involved with kings hammer over the years yeah um a, a couple thoughts i mean first off I, I have a lot of respect for kings hammer i i think they're a great club um, it, it would certainly be an exciting thing for them to become the FCC Academy, but let's be realistic. I, I mean, uh, Cup is is a, even a larger club than they are, and uh, you know there's some other good clubs in the area as well. So to pick one like that, I think would kind of do a disservice to the community, and I think FCC sees that. Um, and and I believe we've we've kind of brought this up in the past a little bit with Luke and. You know, for sure, or or maybe Jeff, for that matter, I can't remember, but for sure, FCC has a great relationship with the Kings Hammer. Uh, they also have pretty good relationships with a lot of the other clubs, and, and they want to partner with these these clubs in the area. They don't want this to be, you know, us against them. They want it to be about building the sport and 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 growing uh, soccer in this community. Um, but I also think that, from what I recall from some of these conversations, FCC compared. And, and I do think this was Luke as I think about it more compared um, what's being done on the girls side of the program now <clears throat> where FCC is a little more hands off, more of a sponsor uh, kind of support it. But, you know, Kings hammer and cup uh, run the program together. I think that um, for the boys side, he specifically said, that they would be more hands-on. I think the idea there is is that it's 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 sort of a similar training mentality to the first team, just scaled down, um, and you know that's kind of the way the whole um, uh, uh, what do you call it? The training grounds is built is from first team down to these DA teams, um, as far as even locker rooms and everything. So so I, I think I think it'll be more in-house. Um, with some relationship building um, uh, with the other clubs. Um, but, but uh, you know, it, it's going to be FCC. I appreciate the email, Brandon. Uh, for those of you who want to send us feedback or emails, uh, you can always do that, uh, feedback at CincinnatiSoccerTalk.com. Uh, just taking a look at some of this, uh, the, the comments here on Facebook, YouTube, and, and Twitter. Uh, this is coming from Zach on YouTube. He wants to know, what do you think the chances are that Frankie Amea is part of the roster to start the season? Uh, if Matty Fernandez and Alan Cruz both sign, I doubt it. But if either one doesn't, could open up a 10 spot. So Boston, um, what are the chances we see Frankie Amea, the number one overall pick and genera- generation Adidas player uh, wearing FCC colors this spring? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I heard I heard some talk about him being uh, sent to Mexico on a loan. And so um, there's that option. And then uh, Luke also said that they're not uh, hesitant to just send out loans and experiment with things. If his development needs that, then I'm I'm more than happy with FCC loaning him out. He's still really young, really raw. And if he needs, you know, that improvement, that's fine. You know, there's there's no shame in that. And he needs to go improve for a couple years. And then that's 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 part of this draft, right? FCC's got two year rights on all of these players, especially uh, 
Frankie Kuzis already signed. So he's a part of this FCC family anyway. And so let's develop him. If he's ready, come preseason, you know, at the end of preseason, then keep him, keep him on the roster. If he's not, let's develop him further. Is there any reason, Bill, to, to doubt this kid? I mean, if you look at just his path to being the number one overall pick, um, wasn't the most highly recruited kid out of high school, ended up going playing at UCLA, which we know is a, a pretty good soccer program, ultimately finds himself on the U-20 national team, wasn't a starter right away, but then just continued to just work and impress Tab Ramos, and now here he is as the number one overall pick. So would it really surprise you that maybe this guy does make the final roster and is playing some significant, well, I shouldn't say significant, but finds himself on the pitch at Nippert Stadium at some point this year? Um, I, I, it would not surprise me to see him on the pitch at Nippert at some point this year. And, um, you know, the thing I liked about him was, uh, when you listen to him talk, uh, he was pretty humble, but he also just said that <clears throat> it's, it's, he doesn't really believe in talent. He just believes in hard work. And I think that's the kind of attitude that's going to get you ahead it's going to be it's going to be what's going to impress coaches and it's going to what it's going to be what makes you get better every day so I, I think he has the right attitude i think he has the right tools i think he shows a lot of potential and and i think uh absolutely he could be somebody playing at nippard whether he gets significant time or not yeah um, i don't know i mean i think that's going to be up to him of course uh, at his age, if he does, that says a lot for him uh, and and such. But, you know, I think we also need to see, uh, you know, what are these uh, maybe last two pieces uh, Luke uh, hinted at, um, you know, who they end up being. So obviously, if we bring in uh, a big name, 10 of some kind, that's going to affect uh, Frankie's time on the pitch. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I think he deserves a, a shot. Uh, certainly, if anybody that we drafted uh, get some time. It should be him. I mean, he was our number one pick. He was certainly somebody that we made, you know, nothing was confirmed, but by rumors, uh, you know, we, we, we left some money on the table to take him. So, yeah, I think we were all aware that LAFC was interested. Uh, they had an up close and personal chance to watch him play last year out in, uh, out in Los Angeles. So i um, glad to see he's wearing the orange and blue. Um, I'd like to think that he, you know, maybe maybe he's just got this it factor that he, you know, just continues to just impress. And, you know, maybe he will get that opportunity. Maybe he'll get loaned out. We'll see. But what we, we do know is that whatever happens to Frankie Maya and all of the Super Draft picks, you can find out more about news, breaking news, anything going on with these guys over at Cincinnati Soccer Talk. Uh, coming up here in just a few moments, we will have uh, CST Extra Time, so make sure you stay tuned for that. I uh, just want to remind you, you can always rate and review the show on iTunes. Head on over to CincinnatiSoccerTalk.com slash iTunes. There you can find uh, you know, you can find our podcast in Apple Podcasts. Uh, you can also head on over to our website, CincinnatiSoccerTalk.com slash subscribe. If you have any questions on how to get subscribed to the show so you don't miss a single episode, we explain it to you over on our website. Again, CincinnatiSoccerTalk.com slash subscribe. So, again, go and check that out. Um, final thoughts as we begin to wrap up here. I'll start with you, Boston. Uh, first of all, it's good to have you back. It's been a while since I've seen your, your lovely face, Mr. Razzle Dazzle Brazzle. Um, you got, I know you're, you're making some plans for, for this upcoming uh, couple friendlies possibly, but uh, any final thoughts as we get out of here? Yeah, um, this is going to be an, a great season, a first season. We're going to remember it for a long time, whether it's good, bad, or um, in the middle. And so uh, I, I see a lot of fans out there traveling to Seattle, Atlanta, uh, and so on, making making bold moves. The, the New York supporters groups already got a four or five game pack that they're going to all hit up. And, man, it's, it's truly impressive to watch this team rally around these games. I think we're going to see way bigger turnout than we even saw in USL which uh, FCC fans really did travel well in, in the USL, especially for what it is. And so proud to be a part of that. Going to hit several games this year. And um, going to, I think the first one I'll make it to is probably Atlanta, trying to do some preseason stuff as well uh, for CST. But, uh, yep, uh, that's that's the, I think that's the most exciting thing. Um, this is a first-year team. 
Uh, we have no idea what's coming uh, when we start that season. There's a nine out of ten playoff team, so I would encourage fans to taper expectations a little bit. That's not to say don't be excited. We should all be excited. It's gonna be it's gonna be great, but um, taper expectations a little bit. That way you don't uh, dive off a cliff when if, if they lose two games in a row. But uh, let's just support that orange and blue. Yes, absolutely. Boston, appreciate you being on the show, buddy. Uh, you're, you're the man. Glad to be back. All right, final thoughts as we get out of here. I throw it over to the Wolfman. I didn't play it at the beginning of the show, but I got it. I saved the best for last, at least the, the best audio. Uh, <laughs> Bill Wolf, as we, we get out of here, your final thoughts? I, I did miss it, so thank you. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, I guess a couple of thoughts on my part. Um I was really intrigued by Luke's comment that, you know, what was it? The statistically, the, the 11 teams that were at the bottom of the table that missed the playoffs uh, had the 11 worst defenses or something to that effect. I don't remember the exact quote, but um, obviously uh, we all like attacking soccer, um, you know, teams that bunker down or are kind of boring to watch. And, and I hope that that's not what we're doing. And I don't think it is because he, he talked about, you know, sort of the, the counter type of uh, 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 game and, and such. But I, I think the point is, is that defending well uh, is important. And, you know, the, the, the saying is, of course, you know, defense wins uh, uh, championships. So I, I don't know that we're going to win uh, the, you know, the MLS cup or anything. I, I'm certainly not predicting that, but I, I think, I think it's worth, maybe feeling a little optimistic that we have very meticulously built this roster up defensively uh, to, to not get uh, destroyed in the MLS and to make sure that we were competitive. Uh, and I'll make a bold prediction that we're going to make the playoffs in our first year. So Whoa. I'm going uh, to go for it. Um, and then I think in the, uh, the second thing I wanted to say was, you know, I, I had a really great time in Chicago uh, it was a lot of fun kind of hanging out with the uh, crew uh, supporters that came and uh, uh, going out for drinks with them afterwards, talking to some of the Chicago based supporters, uh, great group of guys. Of course they were ecstatic, you know, save the crew and all that. <clears throat> so that was, that was a lot of uh, a good time. I, I think this is going to be a really, really fun uh, season. I, I can't wait for rivalry week and, and all the banter that's going to come from that. Um, but I, I do, since I'm, I, it's been a while since I've been on the show. I just want to take the moment to, uh, you know, welcome uh, the Cleveland crew, the 27th MLS expansion team to the MLS. <laughs> so. <laughs> Good. That's gracious. Oh my gosh. Good stuff, Bill. As always appreciate you being on the show. Glad to be here. <laughs> my final thoughts. Um, I want to give a big shout out and thank you to Rob Pierce, our own Rob Pierce, who made the trip up to, to Chicago to cover the draft for us, um, put in a lot of good work up there. And so Rob, thank you very much for doing that. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read his stuff, go over to the website, Cincinnati soccer talk.com. Uh, Rob did a great recap of the, of the draft there. So go check that out. And of course, so uh, we've got a lot of great stuff in store over the next few weeks. So again, continue to head over to the website and uh, I'd love to hear from your feedback at Cincinnati soccer talk.com. All right. My thanks to Luke Sassano, technical director from FC Cincinnati for joining us this week. Of course, my thanks to Boston razzle, dazzle, brazzle and bill Wolf as well. I'm Subs reminding you to watch your tackles. We've got extra time coming up next and we will see you all next week. Hey, we're back. CST Extra Time. It's the part of the show where we let loose a little bit. We answer your questions. uh, So make sure you send those in to us. Hashtag CST Extra Time. All right. Our first question this week comes from Liverpool. I see what you did there, Jacob Clary. By the way, all these Extra Time tweets were, um, uh, I guess, Jacob Clary, our first ever Cincinnati Soccer Talk intern collected all of these tweets and he picked the best out of the lot. So if you're not happy with extra time, uh, well, you can point your fingers at Jacob. <laughs> I'm kidding. Anyway, uh, this first one is from Liverpool is superior to Man U. It just pains me every time to say that. Uh, besides Ledesma, Alashi, and Adi, which player from last year's team do you think will get the most MLS minutes? 
Do you think any of the others will consistently make the 18? Well, I think it's Corbin Bone. I mean, you you heard Luke mention him tonight, and uh, I think we're going to keep hearing his name over and over again. You know, if we talk to Alan, if we talk to these other guys, they're they're high on Bone, and 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 that part of that's the way he has just really risen the last three years and earned his stake on this team. <clears throat> I remember somebody saying what they've tried to, they've tried to bring in competitors for him, but he's just he keeps out doing it, and and really the way he finished off last year is is the testament. So he's going to get a shot. He really is. He's going to get his redemption shot in Major League Soccer where he once played, and I think that's going to be a cool thing to watch. Can he hold up? Does he still have it? Can he really grow even from USL? Um, it's a it's a as a writer, it's an awesome storyline, and I hope uh, Corbin has a lot of success. And to me, that's the guy. You know, if you, if you eliminate Ledesma, it's got to be Corbin. Hmm. Bill has nothing to add. No, I was <laughs> just trying to think it through. It's a, uh, it's a tough one. Um, uh, that's my first reaction as well. I think is Corbin. Uh, you know, I think it depends a little bit on on what comes next. I mean, there's, <clears throat> there's definitely. I think a few more positions we need to fill on the roster. So depending on who we bring in will affect that to a great degree. Um, I was also trying to think a little bit, of, you know, Luke said something to the effect of, you know, one or two more pieces, which doesn't sound like there's a lot more coming. Yeah. Um, if that's the case, uh, you know, you, you can't bring in a, a, a number 10 and a couple wing players. Um, so that kind of leaves who we have out there, but, potentially uh, as our existing wing players, uh, which would which would point very heavily towards Corbin Bone to get some time um, just because, I, I mean, I would say he's the most obvious choice. Uh, if we're running, though, like a 3-5-2, which was one of the you know formations that Luke brought up, then you're not really looking for wings in the same way. So I don't know. I, it's, um, yeah, it's a tough one, but I guess I would go Bone as well. Yeah, and then also what we have international duty, we have Gold Cup. I think Lasso is going to get some playing time in that little uh, area when we lose Garza and guys like that out for for Gold Cup. So uh, all that's something to keep your eye on as well. If I had to pick the one guy that I think is going to get the most minutes, uh, excluding Ledesma, Lashley, and Adi, um, I'm going to say I'm going to say Nas. I think he's going to get some time there at the ten. Uh, I, I think that's because they are really, they're really solid at six and eight right now. Uh, when I say solid, I mean there's a, just a backlog of guys <laughs> that can play that spot, and right now they don't have a whole lot of tens. And I think that's probably where Nas is best suited, uh, just behind the striker, uh, playing that ten spot. So that's my that's going to be my guess. Uh, it's going to be Abadawi. Uh, let's head on over now to the next tweet. This is from Gary Randolph. Give me your confidence level zero to 100% that Lama gets signed. Well, I mean, I think Luke it was kinda, zero before that interview. You're right. It was zero before that interview <laughs> with Luke. But um, I don't know. Where are you at now, Boston? I think about a six. I think he took me all the way up to a six in one interview. So you went from zero to six that quick. Yeah. Are, we, are we out of 100% still? Uh, 60 percent okay 60 okay that's that's i was just making sure that you were on the same (laughs) scale here i mean it says it right on the screen zero to 100 percent you're at six i was like that's not very high i I guess we do have a screen to work with i should yeah maybe you should do some math (laughs) i i knew what he meant though bill so did i but i always like to give boston a hard time yeah you know what i think that's very fair and you should because he sure likes to dish it yes he does (laughs) Uh, what are your thoughts, Bill? You feeling better? Uh, I'm definitely feeling better. I was probably not quite a zero, um, going into the interview, but it would have been probably like maybe a six. Um, so now I would say I'm 35%, 35. Hmm. I guess if I had to lean anywhere, um, I'm not going to go as high as Boston. I'm not going to go as low as Bill. I'll go right in the middle. I'll say 50, 50. It's a 50-50 shot whether Roland Lamar is, uh, you know, with the squad next week. Fingers crossed. Uh, Everyone thinks. 
for your enlightened view there, Subes, of the middle of the road. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I got nothing. Uh, Thank you for the tweet, Gary. Uh, Next tweet, this is from Randy. uh, With the seemingly certain arrival of Maddie Goals, I'm assuming that's Matthias Fernandez, uh, in the future, it would seem that FCC would be considered on paper a formidable opponent in Major League Soccer this year. What are your thoughts? Bill, you had any uh, anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, he would be a phenomenal addition to the team uh, to have somebody with that experience in, in the creative 10 spot uh, would be uh, a game changer for us. Are you concerned <clears throat> about his age? Um, only a little bit. Um, certainly, you know, injury becomes a, a question as you get, you know, up in the 30 pluses. Um, but I, I think for a creative role, you know, I, th- I, I just hearken back to uh, sort of my my favorite crew uh, days, which is when they, you know, went off and they won the Supporter Shield and the MLS Cup. Um, and at that point, I think, you know, Scalato, well, I know Scalato was their DP and he was their uh, their number 10, I think he was like, I want to say 34, um, or at least certainly uh, a similar age to uh, Fernandez. But, you know, a creative player doesn't necessarily have to run a lot. He has to be able to to view the game. He has to have the right IQ. He has to make all the people around him better. So if we have the right wings, we have the right uh, nine, uh, we have some some good sixes and eights behind him to play off of. Um, that guy is going to make everyone around him better, and and I, the age thing doesn't bother me a whole lot. Uh, you know, for for a few years. I mean, he's not gonna he's not gonna be a long term asset. Obviously, you you bring him in for two three years maybe. Um, but I think uh, my big concern is just whether we have the players around him to play off of. So whether we're formidable or not. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, if I, again, harken back to that, those days of the, of the crew, right. You had Eddie Gavin, you had Robbie Rogers, you had Dilly Duca. Um, you had players on the wings that were young, fast, uh, with good technical skills. Um, we've got, you know, two out of three, maybe on a lot of our players. I'm not sure whether we have quite the right wings for that. No. So we'll see. So we did not get this twi- uh, tweet. Uh, before the show, but th- this did just come in. And anytime a fellow Manchester United fan oh. and legend uh, in the broadcasting sphere as far as FC Cincinnati goes, Kevin McCloskey uh, tweeting at us, lads, the real question is this. Assess your CST game fitness for the season ahead, 1 to 10. <laughs> <laughs> uh, game fitness, like actually playing? Uh, uh, is there is there a zero? Uh, I'm like at a negative, I'm at a negative 10. Yeah. Yeah. No, let's, we all assume there's a reason we talk about soccer, Kevin. And that is the <laughs> fact that, uh, we are not so good at playing soccer. Hey, speak for yourself, Boston. <laughs> so, uh, let's just go with, um, let's go, let's go, let's go with how a CST going to do, you know, this season. How are, are we prepped for it? Are we ready? Coverage wise, everything good. Okay. So I got some clarification on what Kevin meant. He right. wants to know as far as attending games. So we know oh. we've got some plans. You're you're, you're going to be making the trip down to Atlanta. Uh, I think Rob is also going to Atlanta. Um, our own Ken Hetker, I believe, is making the trip to Seattle. I'm trying to make the trip to Seattle. Bill, are you going to Seattle? I'll be in Seattle. See, look at that. Um, so we're going to do our best, Kevin, to to get all yeah. as many away Honestly. games as we possibly can. Looking at looking at the different CST staff members and the games they're going to, um, home games of course are all covered. The away games, I think we have most of them covered. You know, I think getting into the summer months, uh, we'll see where everybody's at in their wallets. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it looks it looks pretty good right now. <laughs> Kevin's on fire tonight. Standing up versus sitting down during a game. <laughs> game fitness. Oh uh, yeah, it's gonna be fun. Yeah, we're looking forward to it as well, Kev. How about the Manchester United, Kev? That's right. We got to get back on the show to talk about that. Uh, surprise! You know, as, you know, Brad Weigel's been very quiet lately. The Spurs fan of our group. He, um, I don't know. I don't know why he's so quiet. It was a, it was a good weekend. Anyway, as we move on, uh, last week tonight, this is actually from a Massive Report. So big shout out! I was almost about to tease Bill 
about uh, talking about the crew. And I'm like, hey, Bill, this ain't Columbus Soccer Talk. Uh, but I'm kidding, of course. Uh, we're, we're really excited that the, you know, the crew are staying in Columbus and excited that this rivalry has a chance to continue. And so Massive Report, thank you very much for your tweet and sending it in. Uh, they want to know, how excited are you for Hell is Real? I mean, I mean, how I can't even describe how excited I am. Um, we're so excited we might go see the first one down in Charleston. <laughs> I'm going to try to, but um, things might have changed. I might not be able to make it down there. But I think I speak on behalf of every FC Cincinnati fan uh, that we are absolutely thrilled that the crew are still around. And it's going to make for an exciting an exciting summer, exciting two two games every year, home and away. It's close enough that the fans can travel. It's going to make for some fa- fantastic environments. And, uh, and the fact that the crew, and, I, and, I'm, and I'll be honest, I'm glad that the crew are staying with a different owner. There's a different feel about this team now. And they feel, uh, it, it's exciting. So I'm sure that uh, Bill and Boston, you both agree. Yeah, for the most part. I mean, if you want my full thoughts, go to the Pride's Twitter account, um, look up their newest YouTube video, get screamed at, and that's the rest <laughs> of my thoughts. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Um, yeah, so giving me crap for talking about the crew. Hey, the, 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 there was no FC Cincinnati back then, <clears throat> for one thing. Um, sure. And yes, I was, a, I was a crew fan for a long time, season ticket holder. Um, on the flip side, uh, my mother gave me a joke Christmas gift this year of a crew scarf. <laughs> so I've come a long way. Um, also, uh, my wife uh, literally is still wearing... Uh, her uh, winter jacket, which is a crew jacket we bought at the stadium uh, like 15 years ago. Uh, and I'm desperately working to get a, an FCC jacket of some kind for her so we can we can change that out. So, yes, uh, used to be a crew fan. Uh, certainly some great times there. But uh, they going down. Uh, I told the guys in uh, uh, Chicago when we were there, I said, you know, I don't know how the season's going to go. Uh, all I care is, is that we're at least 2 and 32. Do the math. <laughs> I got there. <laughs> oh, good stuff. Uh, that's it. That's That does it for extra time. Uh, on a scale of uh, 0 to 10, Boston, how did Jacob do picking the tweets this week? Um, we'll, give him, we'll give him a 9. Not bad. Well, wow, you're Not bad. going very easy on the new intern. I mean, this guy, he, he he's, you know, we're, we don't have a – a brick and mortar building, so he doesn't have to go get his donuts or d- coffee or anything like that. He's just got to well, pick you know, out tweets. You know what? I thought he did well. Like a, a bunch of our extra time questions were actually answered in the show. Luke did a great job of hitting some of those concerns, and so uh, he did a good he did a good job dodging the ones we've already covered. In so maybe he's a psychic. I'm, I'm not going to go that far. He he goes to Bowling Green, and as a Bowling Green guy, um, I know better. I'm teasing Jacob. We're very excited to have you on board as our very first intern. So uh, we'll continue to do extra time after these shows. So, so make sure you send us your tweets, hashtag CST extra time. We'll see. Uh, yeah, we'll see everybody next Monday night. Bye. <laughs>